Alleluia. Father, we pray indeed that as your word is proclaimed at this pulpit today, which is a handful gathered, that nevertheless it would join the testimony of all the saints through all the ages and all the churches who have truly been redeemed and proclaim your holy word and those who you prepared for the gospel to come such that the magnification of your voice through these multiple means would go forth to the far corners of the earth proclaiming the news that Jesus is Lord. Lord, I pray that we would be bowed before in humility and submission your holy word today that declares to us through the pages of Old Testament and New that Jesus Christ is King of Kings. When we come in contact with this truth, we find ourselves guilty and falling short of your great glory. But we also find in the revelation of the pages of your holy word, and by the Spirit's opening the doors of our heart, that there is salvation in that holy name. That Jesus died to pay the penalty of a just God, deserving of those who had sinned against him, and committed that Agreed those egregious acts of cosmic treason against the thrice holy, powerful God. Lord, we know that you condemn sin, and rightfully so, and can and will do something about it. We are so thankful as your blood-bought saints today that you have paid the penalty for that transgression and iniquity upon the cross of Jesus Christ, on his torn body and his spilled blood. Remind us of these truths today. Quicken our hearts, Lord, to build our lives upon them. Strengthen the confidence and clarity of our testimony. And reveal and open your scriptures to us, we pray, as we seek to grow in understanding and obedience to the call, Lord, that is a great privilege of every saint to walk in, to glorify your name, to walk in a manner that you have laid forth according to your statutes, your precepts, your rules, and all that you have written in the pages of scripture the whole counsel of your holy word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Well, what a great day and occasion. What a privilege and a gift of grace to be able to gather in the name of Jesus with a fuller house than we've had in recent weeks as well, I might add, to the praise of the Lord's name, answering prayers and healing the sick, and bringing us home safely from vacation, etc., so we might worship Him. What an awesome privilege to do so as the family of God in His house and with the saints in the presence of our Lord and guided by His Spirit. Today, I'd like to open the Scriptures to Genesis 44 and continue to document in our sermon series from this first book of the canon, the testimony of Joseph as it relates to his ministry to his brothers. And we see this continuing to unfold as the interaction between the covenant family uh, continues with one more installment and chapter. We're getting pretty close to that revelation, that unveiling, that kind of surprise, that shocking moment, at least to the brothers, when Joseph will tell them after 22 years of estrangement, guess who I am? I'm not only the second in command of Egypt, but I'm also the brother you sold into slavery two plus decades ago. And so the suspense is building in the text. But there's a purpose for Joseph's sort of plan and strategy. And we've documented this in thus far as to bring uh, not only a test that would show him where his brothers are, but a test from God's perspective that would soften their hearts and encourage repentance unto restoration of his purposes and the covenant family. Today we see this theme continuing in Genesis 44, 1 through 17. I've titled the message test, that would be a test of the brothers, and testimony. This would be their knowledge of what's going on and their knowledge of themselves and the truth, and particularly in the case of Judah as the chapter unfolds, test and testimony. The aim of this morning's message is to follow this chain of events leading unto repentance and redemption. And we can quickly make the uh, parallel, I trust, to our own lives and even looking back how God has used tests and things that confused us and we weren't aware of their purpose at the time to lead us to a softer heart, to repentance and redemption. So this is a great theme of our text today. Out of reverence for God's word, would you stand with me today in the hearing and uh, listen as the word of God is proclaimed in your hearing this is the infallible word of the Lord recorded for us in Genesis 44, verses 1 through 17. Here's God's holy scripture. Then he commanded, he meaning Joseph, 
Then he commanded the steward of his house, fill the men's sacks with food, as much as they can carry, and put each man's money in the mouth of his sack, and put my cup, the silver cup, in the mouth of the sack of the youngest with his money for the grain. And he did as Joseph told him. As soon as the morning was light, the men were sent away with their donkeys. They had gone only a short distance from the city. Now Joseph said to his steward, Up, follow after the men, and when you, have overtake, and when you overtake them, say to them, Why have you repaid evil for good? Is it not from this that my Lord drinks, and by this that he practices divination? You have done evil in doing this. Verse 6, When he overtook them, he spoke to them these words. They said to him, why does our Lord speak such words as these? Far be it from your servants to do such a thing. Behold, the money that we found in the mouths of our sacks we brought back to you from the land of Canaan. And then, could we, how then could we steal silver or gold from your Lord's house? Whichever of your servants is found with it shall die. And we also will be my Lord's servants. He said, Let it be as you say, He who is found with it shall be my servant, and the rest of you shall be innocent. Then each man quickly lowered his sack to the ground, and each man opened his sack. And he searched, beginning with the eldest and ending with the youngest. And the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Then they tore their clothes, and every man loaded his donkey, and they returned to the city. When Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house, he was still there. They fell down to the ground. Joseph said to them, What is this deed that you have done? Do you not know that a man like me can indeed practice divination? Then Judah said, What shall we say to my Lord? And what shall we speak? Or how can we clear ourselves? God has found out the guilt of your servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also in whose hand the cup has been found. But he said, Far be it from me that I should do so. Only the man in whose hand this cup was found shall be my servant. But as for you, go in peace to your father." This is the word of God. You may be seated. A test and testimony. A subtitle for this message might be Judah's Redemptive Arc. Arc, A-R-C, kind of the course of a story, beginning and end. It's fairly typical to have that setting, characters, conflict, that unveiling of the plot towards a happy ever after or a purpose for the story or some kind of resolution. This is no exception, however, it is absolutely true, that, and, and this is a story arc by God's design, and includes Judah's redemption in particular, but more redemptive themes still. So as we trace this arc, we see another installment in God's purposes in this regard. The record of Joseph's rule and reign, which by the way was the, the title of our last message, Joseph's rule and reign, Joseph's rule continues to be documented in chapter 44 as we read of this next step in his elaborate design to test his brother's heart and character following 20 plus years of estrangement because of their sinful betrayal. Now we've noted there are aspects of Joseph's rule that are indeed a great example and truly commendable. This is a brief aside and application, but I marked a few things down that I've noticed that Joseph's rule represented. What was he inspiring men to do? What was the nature of his leadership and example? What was the purpose of the things that he used his throne to accomplish, if you will? Well, he was moving men, God through him, to heart change. Joseph's rule and reign was moving men to heart change. It was moving men to a restoration of conscience, he was moving them to personal responsibility and sacrifice. The way that he was organizing his decisions and ordering his rule encouraged and endorsed the honoring of parents. It spoke of and was built on and encouraged truth and honesty in covenants, promises and contracts between peoples. He endorsed the sanctity of life and he promoted and provided for that even with his wisdom and providing for the destitute in times of famine. Also, his rule was marked by family reconciliation, covenant hope, and succession, just to name a few. And this morning, you might be troubled, as I have been in recent weeks, and perhaps much longer than that, at the lack of character and integrity in the rulers that often make decisions for our future and for our culture and the way we arrange our affairs. And our state is no exception to a troubling record in this regard. 
we should make it a prayer and be encouraged that God can change hearts and that when godly rule is established, it really truly is a blessing to the people and ends up encouraging and building from the ground up a solid society. Let us pray for conviction, for hearts to change, for leaders to arise according to the legacy of Joseph, for those who fall short that they would repent or be removed from their position of authority. After that aside, let me continue. Not only is Joseph a great example of leadership in his ideals, the things that he valued as far as principles applied, but he is also being used by God to encourage others to be godly leaders as well. This was certainly evident in Judah's case. Judah is the chosen son, by the way, through whom the messianic line would continue. Joseph gets a lot of focus, but God has purposes through Judah. While Judah had pledged in chapter 43, verse 9, that he, and this was a mark of his changing character, and this was a commitment, a vow that he had made to his father. He had said, I will pledge to be his safety, speaking of Benjamin, made this promise to Jacob, from my hand you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. So this was a commitment that Judah had made, and now that commitment would be tested. He had assured his father concerning the safe passage of Benjamin to and from Egypt, I will be his pledge of safety, he had said. Now Joseph could not have known by ordinary means this promise Judah had made to his father. Nevertheless, the hand of Joseph proves to be, I submit, an extension of the hand of the Lord, testing him in this regard. The extension of the hand of the Lord is evident in the rule of Joseph as the circumstances unfold, softening the brother's heart and working in this situation unto reconciliation of the covenant family. There's evidence of significant heart change, and it's increasingly apparent as we read. If you think about it, there were a number of options the brothers, just in their own uh, thinking and man's wisdom or walking in the flesh, might have considered. How about just this? How about simply leave Benjamin behind, captive in Egypt, and never return home? They could have done this, right? This would, they could have assumed that their father would, would think, well, they've encountered trouble along the way. Travel in those days was dangerous, and they had fooled him once before with the bloody garments of their one brother, Joseph. And then, you know, they could go and establish themselves elsewhere, take their food, maybe live closer to Egypt, and seek to cover their guilt that way and be done with it. This would have been a strategy in keeping with their actions and intentions of 22 years ago. But what do we witness instead? Instead, we witness profound changes of heart. This chapter, considered alongside another one, verse, or chapter 38, I submit illustrates this in very profound ways. And I think we'll touch upon chapter 38 if you want to keep a thumb in that one. We'll go back and forth between 44 and 38. My reason for doing this is Judah's apostasy, his former wickedness, is laid out in graphic detail in chapter 38. And when we consider this alongside his growing character and his commitment and the return to covenant priorities that he demonstrates in 44, we can see the scope and the purpose and the power of God's redemptive plan, particularly in Judah, changing his heart and by this means and others extending his redemptive purposes to the family as well. And that's what I see highlighted in these passages, and among other things, is so encouraging. So the events of chapter 44, this first fat half, unfold according to the following. These are just three events, if you will, that uh, separate our passage today, divided up. If you have your notes, these would be the three major points. Joseph's plan. So the events of chapter 44 unfold according to, number one, Joseph's plan, verses 1 through 5. Secondly, the events unfold according to the brother's vow, 6 to 13. And thirdly, and finally this morning, these events continue to unfold according to Judah's confession in verses 14 and 17. And Lord willing, next time we're in this passage, we'll see Judah continuing to not only give a confession, but also an intercession to intercede on behalf of Benjamin, which is just a powerful account. And really, uh, I suggest that in this passage, there's a crescendo of repentance and tenderness that we see as God continues to work through these circumstances. 
So number one, Joseph's plan, the events of chapter 44 unfolding. Visiting again verse 1, uh, consider this scheme that Joseph has come up with. He commanded the steward of his house. So this is Joseph's dude that helps him with all his stuff. He organizes things. We see him in the prior chapter, if you remember. Joseph's steward, we assume it is the same, that the brothers interact with while the meal is being prepared. So this is the second in command's right-hand man. He's given these instructions. Fill the men's sacks with food, Joseph says, as much as they can carry, and put in each man's um, and put each man's money in the mouth of his sack. And if you've been following, you'll probably get deja vu there. This has happened before. It's the same thing that Joseph had his servant do on the first journey. And you'll recall, they brought this money back. They didn't, uh, they didn't know why it was there, whether it was just the kindness of the heart of the Grand Vizier of Egypt, or they were being framed for theft, would err on the side of integrity and restore that to its proper owner. But here it is again. This money, now probably double the amount, is in each man's bag. Verse 2, something else is placed. Put my cup, the silver cup, in the mouth of the sack of the youngest with his money for the grain. Kids, who is the youngest of Jacob's sons, the youngest of the brothers? Benjamin, Benjamin that's correct. And Benjamin, remember, because Jacob thinks Joseph's dead, who is his favorite son now? Jacob's favorite son now is who? Yeah, same answer. So I, did I hear Benjamin? So he did, the servant did as Joseph had told them. And then in verse 3, as soon as the morning was light, the men were sent away with their donkeys, and Joseph lets them go only a little ways. And we see the tenderness of Joseph. He's virtually bursting at the seams with the love and compassion and desire to reveal himself. And chapter 45 opens this way. The men don't get very far, and I think one of the reasons is the tenderness of Joseph's heart. How far have they gone to a steward? And he's kind of tapping his hands and, okay, we'll wait a little longer. A little, go, go, let, go find them. And so when they'd only gone a short distance from the city, now Joseph said to his servant, up, follow after the men. And when you overtake to them, take them, say to them, why have you repaid evil for good? Is it not this, from this, speaking of that cup, that my Lord drinks and by this that he practices divination you have done evil in doing this. Joseph's plan begins with a pretext. What is a pretext? Well, the dictionary definition, a purpose or motive alleged, it's like on the surface. It's the appearance of assumed order or something assumed in appearance in order to cloak the real intentions or state of affairs. So there's several pretexts here. Joseph kind of sets up this whole situation. Pretext might include this money placed strategically in the sacks, as well as this so-called cup of divination. So on the surface, the brothers are like, what is going on here? They're confused, and in the immediate, it seems like they're caught red-handed in an apparent crime. But there's other intentions underneath the surface here. God is working through this pretext according to a plan that Joseph had instituted to draw them back and to work in this situation again unto redemption and reconciliation. So in this case, the pretext includes the presumption of stolen items, as I mentioned, and, the, and that provides an opportunity to confront the brothers of past sins and to assess current heart conditions. So the brothers are caught red-handed with something they didn't even do, even though they had gotten away, they thought, with a sin 22 years ago when they sold their brother into slavery and then fooled their father with the clothes stained with goat's blood, claiming he had been torn apart by a wild animal. So it's interesting. Will we ever get away with sin? Of course, the answer is no. But sometimes we deceive ourselves that we can justify ourselves through false atonement and being clever, and that will kick the can of reckoning, accountability, responsibility down the road. For, but for those whom the Lord loves, He will test and He will order their lives and set up a pretext, if you will, to bring them to heal and to accountability and to acknowledgement of their sin. Are you not thankful, believer, in this room, if you can think back in your life how the Lord has used things to bring you to a knowledge of your own wickedness and depravity 
and then unto salvation. There are times, you know, it's a great curse when the Lord allows the, fat, or the uh, wicked and those who are rebellious against him to be sleek and happy and in, in charge and to gain basically much of what their goals. And the psalmist laments this very thing. I believe it's in Psalm 73. Why do the wicked prosper? Why do they have everything they could want? Why do the, the uh, you know, even today we think of wicked men who control the levers of power, the cultural gatekeepers in our own experience, and they seem to have so much influence and live to be 90 plus years old. And what's going on here? Well, there's a great judgment upon men like that. Unless God would bring them in the final hour to repentance, you'll notice that they have not that they have been successful in their sinful intentions. And if they die in that state, then what has happened? They, they've been given over to their deception and have never had the opportunity to come to grips with how they have violated God's law, turn from their sin, and repent. Well, in the case of Joseph's brothers, though it had been a long time, the favor and kindness of the Lord and His redemptive purposes and the grace of God leading them even to guilt of their own sin has extended a 22-year-long hand, if you will, to reach into their hearts and to bring them to a place of humility and repentance. Now, this pretext gave Joseph the opportunity to confront jealousy. As we see here, he gives his servant instructions. The man, the Lord of the land, oh, excuse me. So he did, Joseph did, or the uh, servant did as Joseph had told him. So he goes, he catches up with the brothers, Joseph had said to the steward, Up, follow after these men, and when you have overtaken them, say to them, Why have you repaid evil for good? Is it not from this that my Lord drinks? And so forth. Have, why have you repaid evil for good? So this is a leading question, I suggest. The pretext is, Okay, I've given you this grain. Why do you steal my money when I have offered you this help in time of famine? However, underneath the surface, this message is, runs much deeper. You think of the history between the brothers, and the underlying issue is the brother's spiteful malice 22 years ago. Why have you repaid evil with good? The revelation of God's word had appeared to Joseph in dream form back in 37. And although they resented and were jealous of the fact that they might have to bow before their brother someday, and that caused them to react in rebellion and malice, nevertheless, that was a good thing that God had revealed. There would come a time when, if it were not the, for the Lord, raising up from among the brothers a Savior from famine, ascending from a lowly place, a pit, to rule, to provide messianic hope for the future line of the Messiah, and to save the entire family from starvation, there would be no hope, no future. There would be nothing but bleached bones on the deserts of the Near East to be found later by marauding bands, to go through their stuff and take the last of their tents and robes, and that would be the last we hear of the covenant family. There was, but God was uh, preparing a Savior to intervene in their time of great need. And this message of God's Word, by dream to Joseph, and then by his confession to his brothers, how is this good received? That good was repaid with evil. And their short-sighted jealousy, and their blindness, and in their self-centered spite, they threw him into a pit after plotting to kill him and decided on a compromise and sold him to merchants from the Ishmaelite tribes heading for Egypt. And thus Joseph became a slave in Potiphar's house. This test now, though, provides them opportunity to acknowledge their guilt. But you'll see the way it's set up. There's plausible deniability as far as the immediate concern. Oh, we are not guilty. Rewind, you know, if they had surveillance tapes. Rewind the uh, video. You'll see. <laughs> Your servant placed these things in our bags. We had nothing to do with it. You know, you could see them standing before the court with confidence saying, this absolutely isn't true. Put your servant to the test. I guarantee you put it in there. It's not us. And so the immediate circumstances allow them some deniability. But the question runs much deeper. There is a jealousy that's being confronted. There's past sin that's being addressed. The opportunity to repent of repaying evil for good 22 years ago is upon them. And it strikes a heart. It strikes a chord in their hearts. And the Lord uses this to draw them back to a place, to a right frame of mind and a softness of soul, confronting jealousy. 
Joseph also, in this plan, invokes sovereignty. And this, again, I suggest as a pretext, he references this cup. Now, to kind of maintain this illusion of him as this Egyptian ruler, not having yet revealed, I am your brother, long estranged, he says, Is it not from this, verse 5, that my Lord drinks, this is his steward, by the way, and by this that he practices divination, you have done evil in doing this. So the steward says to the brothers, did you think you would get away with this? Don't you know that my master, he has tools of divination? In other words, he has access to supernatural knowledge. So this is a reference to the belief of the ancients that uh, kings, pharaohs, and so forth, and elite and powerful, had special abilities. But really, that's the pretext. Underneath this is the acknowledgement that there is a sovereign knowledge of every man's heart, and no one ultimately will get away with anything. Given, that is to say, ultimate reckoning, supernatural knowledge, final judgment, and the omniscience, the all-knowing and all-powerful nature of the one true God, Yahweh, creator of heaven and earth, given this truth, there, it is a utterly foolish notion to think that you could get away with any kind of sin. This cup, the cup of divination is symbolic. It kind of represents something. Represents, I suggest, the omniscience and the sovereignty of the one true God, the one true judge, the one true Savior, the one who is not second in command of Egypt, but the one who created Egypt and the whole world, and before whom everyone one day will give account. So Joseph's plan sets up this situation where there's an opportunity and a test to confront jealousy. It invokes this sovereignty and this sense of accountability. And then we see a con... And finally, under this point, I just want to draw a contrast to the life of Judah before. This goes back to chapter 38. So turn back with me to 38, 1 through 5. We'll just touch upon a few points here. As you turn there, while Joseph's strategy is implemented to reconcile the covenant family by way of repentance and forgiveness, the exact opposite was the consequences that Judah displayed following the sin that sent Joseph away in the first place. So again, there's a powerful contrast in the text. In our passage here, we see that God is using these circumstances. He's using Joseph's plan. He's using it to reconcile the covenant family by way of repentance and forgiveness. But the opposite was the case in Judah in 38.1. It happened at that time that Judah went down from his brothers and turned aside to a certain Adulamite whose name was Hira. Profound language. Instead of embracing the God's purposes through the covenant family, Judah led away by his sinful heart in this apostasy, if you will, falling away from his once confessed covenant and spiritual associations. He puts his brothers aside and his family, abandons them, and goes to live among the pagans and commits covenant compromise. And we identified two real red flags in this passage, this chapter 38. Two things that lead to disorder and falling apart of a soul and a community and a country, if you will. And that would be lack of the fear of God and covenant compromise, especially marriage. So when marriages fall apart and no one fears the Lord, things go south in a a hurry. And this was certainly the case in Judah's experience. So this lady that he took for his wife from among the pagans, the unbelievers, she conceived, she bore a son, she bore yet another. Things go from bad to worse. Judah takes a wife for his first son. God kills him. And uh, there's uh, the judgment that is falling on the house. And uh, the dysfunction continues to snowball. So we see here that at this moment, this low point in chapter 38, there's a real hopelessness and despair that would certainly settle upon the reader if that was the final chapter in the book of Genesis, but it's not. Years later, chapter 44 opens, and we see God drawing back together a family that had been separated by sin. The irresponsibility, the wayward heart, and the uh, the transgressions of Judah created this a whole horrible situation. But now God, through this test and through his sovereign plan and means, is restoring what the enemy once had stolen and sought to destroy. Praise the Lord for his redemptive plan. 
The events of chapter 44 are unfolding according to this plan, Joseph's plan, and second major point, the brother's vow. So when they're overtaken, and they have to answer for themselves, the brothers speak in verses 16 through 13. When he overtook them, he spoke to them these words. They said to him, verse 7, Why does my Lord speak such words as these? Far be it from your servants to do such a thing. Behold, the money that we found in the mouth, mouths of our sacks we brought back to you from the land of Canaan. And then could we steal silver or gold from, our, from your Lord's house? Whichever of your servants is found shall die. And we also will be my Lord's servants. He, of course, uh, delegated steward of Joseph, speaking on his behalf, verse 10, says, Let it be as you say, he who is found with it shall be my servant and the rest of you shall be innocent. Then each man quickly lowered his sack to the ground, and each man opened his sack, and he searched, beginning with the eldest and ending with the youngest. And the cup was found in whose bag, kids? Benjamin. Uh Uh-oh. And how did they respond? The anguish of their response is recorded by this action, verse 13. Then they tore their clothes, and every man loaded his donkey, and they returned to the city. The brothers vow. The brothers vow according to integrity, by the way. They take responsibility and they answer this charge. They commit themselves to being accountable for any potential wrong. Each one does not know the heart of the next brother, but they submit to being investigated by the authorities. They commit to being accountable for their actions. They ask to be searched, if you will, and if there's any wrong or sin or crime to be found among them, that proper payment would be made. They're resolved and prepared to bear the cost of responsibility in this matter up to and including their life and livelihood. Resolved to bear the cost of responsibility up to and including their life, in the case of the man who took uh, whatever was the allegation, and their livelihood, they all would become servants if they were indeed found guilty. So the brothers are demonstrating by this vow of integrity a change of heart indeed. It's the opposite frame of mind that they operated in when in order to to satisfy their jealous hearts, they took the life of their brother into their own hands and sold him into slavery and then destroyed their father's life and broke his heart for so many years. All along, all the while, Jacob assuming his beloved son is dead. Things are changing, though. The brothers' hearts, through this test, now have a stronger testimony of responsibility and accountability. They are submitting themselves to the Lord, to His sovereign hand, even through these circumstances. And they decide that they will take the right step and answer for what they have potentially done. And of course, this investigation goes deeper still, and that again is the purpose, pretext versus purpose, or pretext leading to purpose. Now, there are covenant terms in this arrangement negotiation that the brothers agree to. Penalty negotiations ensue between the steward and the brothers. So they offer to him, okay, we'll allow you to search us, and if we are guilty, they suggest that they would be held accountable, and they give this idea in, of penalty in verse 9. They propose this penalty, whichever of your servants is found with it shall die, and we also will be my Lord's servants. And you'll notice here in this vow that the brothers not only have a mind and heart to take responsibility, but they don't belittle the potential, uh, the potential penalty for their crimes. You know, they could have offered, usually negotiations start much lower, and it's in the best interest of the accused to argue for a lesser sentence. Isn't this what almost always goes on in modern courts? We call it plea deals, right? The accused will argue with the prosecution and say, how about in exchange for a lesser deal, I'll give you some information that might be helpful in a further case down the road or something like that. And so there's this tension. Well, here the tables are reversed. The brothers offer a stronger possible penalty than the steward himself suggests. In verse 10, he said, Let it be as you say, but then he modifies the terms. He who is found with it shall be my servant, so no one will die, according to his terms, and the rest of you shall be innocent, and the rest of you will be free to go. So you see here, even in this penalty negotiation, that the brothers are willing 
to pay. They're not interested in lessening the burden of their guilt. And this represents a change in the term or and a, a change in their heart. The motives of the accused in ordinary situations almost always aim to limit the penalty for wrongdoing as much as possible, regardless of the guilt. But the brothers come to a different conclusion. If we are guilty, then may God's word be upheld in the just penalty of our own souls. There's a, let me give an anecdote, a famous, by way of illustration, a famous serial killer who is popularly known as the son of Sam. And I've read a bit about him through the years. Of course, I can't vouch for the integrity of his testimony at the heart level. God certainly can. But in incarceration, serving a life, you know, in, for his crimes, life in prison for his crimes, from time to time, then the son of Sam over the years says, come on up for parole on good behavior and so forth. And part of the reason for his good behavior is he's given his life to Christ. And his testimony is that he has repented of his sin and trusts the Lord and now seeks to serve the Lord in prison. And I remember reading something fairly profound. He had an open letter to the victims of his prior crimes. And he said, I will be coming up for parole in coming months. I disagree with this. And I will advocate that I remain in prison. This is right and just according to the crimes I've done. And I want to reassure you that that is my priority in spite of what the, you know, what the procedures might happen. And that is my commitment. So this would, you could add to the fruit of a heart changed something fairly significant. When people begin to love the word of God more than their own plight and personal well-being, that illustrates a submission to God Almighty. This is something that we need to return to the consciousness. We're so wired in our sin and selfishness to argue for the least amount of responsibility possible that what is often lost is the testimony of the righteousness and justice and the character of God. And once these things are restored, two things will happen. First, we will have a society that honors justice and righteousness, and it will serve much better to create cohesive covenants and relationships and a stability of social order in our land. But secondly, it will also also testify to the power of Jesus' blood to save. That is to say, when we realize the guilt our sin truly deserves, then we will not take for granted the horrible, excruciating penalty that Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, paid to set us free from those consequences. But if we think our sin isn't deserving of all that much, then the holiness of God and the cost of Jesus' sacrifice is also negotiated. So even here, in this kind of a symbolic way, in the interaction and the negotiations that are happening and the brothers vow, we see a growing appreciation for the law of God that has gospel illustrations and consequences. And this is helpful for us to see from this sort of bigger picture bird's eye view of how God is organizing the life and circumstances of this family to work in their hearts. Now, the last part of this vow uh, closes with a sort of uh, an expression of anguish. Verse 13, then they tore their clothes and every man loaded his donkey and they returned to the city. Who's guilty, kids? According to the circumstances, who is guilty of stealing the cup? It would appear Benjamin, that's right. Same answer to all the questions today. So Benjamin appears guilty of stealing the cup. But I thought the brothers despised the favored son of their father. I thought it was the special robe given to Joseph that made them so jealous before. But now they are in anguish. They are heartbroken. They are stressed out and in deep uh, sorrow over the thought that their youngest brother might be framed for a crime. Something has changed. In their response to the guilt of, apparent guilt of Jacob, the brothers go from inflicting pain upon their, the favored brother to sharing their father's anguish over the threat of their sibling. In verse 34 of chapter 37, you know, they had delivered these bloodstained robes to quote-unquote prove a fierce animal had devoured Joseph. And Jacob responds this way, Then Jacob tore his garments and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son many days. 
And now we see, 22 years later, at the thought that Benjamin might be convicted of a crime and thus be the servant of the grand vizier's household, they, the brothers, tore their clothes and every man loaded his donkey and they returned to the city. Did they have to return? Probably not. The servant had said, no, nope, whoever's guilty comes back and he will be my servant. The rest will be deemed innocent. Presumably, the rest of the brothers were free to go. They did not go. They went back. Why? They went back to intercede for their brother, especially, and represented by Judah in this case. They went back because their hearts were torn at the thought of their father losing another beloved son and them losing a brother to Egypt. And here we see a rightful sense of anguish, a sorrow returning to their softening heart. The hand of God ordering this investigation much like even the seating arrangement, oldest to youngest, until you get to the youngest, and this building sense of, you know, uh, suspense is met with this accusation of the stolen cup, and then they tear their clothes in sorrow. And in this, they finally share something that they should have felt when they put their brother in such a horrible position, Joseph, so many years ago. And they finally felt and identified with their father's loss of his favored son. And now the Lord has worked in them a softness that will move them to a different course of action. And this leads us to major point number three, events of chapter 44 unfolding according to Judah's confession, 14 through 17. So we have Joseph's plan. We have now the brother's vow and then Judah's confession. By the way, I won't touch upon this with every point, but I marked them in my own notes. If you go back to chapter 38 and Mark verses 6 through 14, and that's Judah's apostasy, what you'll see there as well, in our chapter today, Joseph exercises the leverage of leadership in an effective and godly way, and consequently his brothers rise to the occasion with responsibility and accountability. The total opposite was the case back when Judah was not walking with the Lord. This was anything but the case in his household shortly after the betrayal of Joseph. Instead, his family life was marked by failed headship. Headship meaning he, as the father and the husband of his household, was meant to lead his family in godliness and righteousness, to set the standard, to advocate on their behalf, to teach them in the ways of the Lord. And instead of doing that, he, his commands were disregarded, his promises were broken, and things go from bad to worse, horrible, including all the way to incest with his own daughter-in-law, unbeknownst to him, and then twins are born as consequence. So again, if you want to see, by greater illustration still, the contrast in the before and after picture of God's redemption and intervention in this family, You can go to chapter 38, compare it to ours, and see the scope of the change of what's going on. This is a different Judah now. The old Judah was a loser. And this Judah actually is quite the uh, changed man as he begins to take responsibility for his brother and speak on behalf of his family. We see this in verse 14, back in 44. When Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house, He was still there, meaning Joseph, they, the brothers, fell before him to the ground. Joseph said to them, What deed is this that you have done? Do you not know that a man like me can practice divination? Do you think you'd get away with this? Verse 16, And who said? Judah said, What shall we say to my Lord? Or what shall we speak? Or how can we clear ourselves? God has found out the guilt of your servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also in whose hand the cup has been found. We all commit to be your servants. No excuses. We are guilty. We've been found out. As Judah confesses this and then goes on in the next portion to intercede for Benjamin, we see a sort of restoration of headship. We see Judah, who had been called and appointed, to be in the line of the Messianic lineage, restored to a place of actually speaking on behalf, representing his brothers. This, by the way, is a third fulfillment of Joseph's sheaf dream. Joseph had prophesied that you will bow 
before me one day, and as much as the pictures illustrated this, the men, now his brothers, more than one time have just laid low before him and surrendered themselves to his mercy and acknowledged his sovereignty in the matter. And they still don't realize it, but even after they do, they bow to him once again, even 17 years later, at the close of Genesis, chapter 50, verse 18. So the Lord is fulfilling prophecy, and he's also restoring Judah in his calling. Judah is recognized in the context here as the spokesman representing his brothers and interceding for Benjamin. This is a significant redemptive moment given, as we've mentioned before, the utter failure of Judah's headship and leadership in chapter 38. But this was necessary that God would change his heart and restore this man because of the purposes that the Lord has to bring the Messiah according to the line of Judah. Now, not only is headship restored, but also this exclusive omniscience, this reference to supernatural knowledge appears again, this pretext of the cup of divination. Joseph said to them, what deed is this that you have done? Do you not know that a man like me indeed can practice divination? And so just to give you an idea historically what's in view here, one of the ancient practices the historians tell us is that the guy who was, you know, who was seen to have the power of the gods had this special cup. Divination means ability to tell the future by superstitious ways. So they'd fill the cup with water and sometimes they would dribble some oil in and there'd be some agitation in the oil and, you know, supposedly based on the direction of that oil, a Ouija board or something, a yes, an answer, yes or no, or a directive was to be discerned by the guy who had the powers and the instruments of divination. So this is the reference here. Joseph has a cryptic, I would say, a mysterious reference to divination powers. That would be supernatural knowledge. And remember, he's still kind of maintaining this disguise and not revealing who he truly is. So uh, Judah goes on to confess indeed The superintendence of a sovereign and divine knowledge is indeed the case, and therefore they've been found out and they are guilty. But notice, he does not fear the divination of Egypt, but ascribes the supernatural knowledge to the one true God. Judah said, what should we say then to my Lord, or what should we speak? And naturally, if you stop reading there, you might assume, yeah, we recognize by, you know, the testimony of your kingdom and by the power of your influence, that you must have some special powers. We're sorry, we're sorry. We believe that you truly can magically discern the future with a cup and a bit of oil in the top. No, this is not what Judah says. He says, how can we clear ourselves? God has found out the guilt of your servants, both we and our Lord's servants. I'm not sure if this test was thought all the way through by Joseph, but it certainly was a test given by the Lord. And the test was this. When the knowledge of their behavior was revealed to them, and would they affirm, so this, would they ascribe, the brothers, this power to know their hearts, to search them uh, to the Egyptian deities, or what is jealously maintained by the Lord himself, only the one true God of Yahweh. So the design of this test was such that the brothers had the opportunity, it would appear in their best interest to affirm the power of the second in command. Oh yeah, you're so powerful, you definitely have that ability. Or they could recognize that no, the one true God is jealous of this power. There is no such thing as a superstitious divination cup. And Judah, in fact, ascribes the knowledge of searching man's hearts to the Lord himself. And of course, Joseph has done this as well. You know, when people were attempted to, or when people were ascribing to him the power to interpret dreams, he quickly said, no, the Lord, the one true God alone has the power to reveal dreams. So now we see uh, Joseph's brothers joining his testimony of the sovereignty of God. There is an awareness in their heart, in their mind, in their consciousness that is informing their actions that they live their lives in light of of the Lord's perfect knowledge and His holiness, His sovereignty, His reckoning, and they're at His mercy and at His grace, and not even this guy who holds, apparently, their life in His hands is to overshadow or cast shade on the sovereignty of God. So this is part of Judah's confession. In Judah's confession, we see his position restored to some degree. 
we see this acknowledgement of the omniscience, the sovereignty of God. And of course, this again is in stark contrast to the moral catastrophe that once characterized his legacy. If Judah had died after chapter 38, he had been known for. He would have been known for not sound moral judgments, like Joseph expressed here, not integrity and responsibility as Judah is demonstrating, but instead deception, manipulation, prostitution, and incest, adding insult to the injury of the brazen cruelty of human trafficking, as it was Judah's idea in the first place to sell his brother, Joseph, into slavery. So we see quite a change here. Judah's legacy is being redeemed. He will not be known for these things, but we will name our children after Judah. There might be a Judah named after Judah in our church. Why is this? Well, because of God's redeeming power. Judah's name will be associated with Jesus Christ. He will be the lion of the tribe of what? Sorry, give it away. Judah, awesome. Jesus himself is known as the lion of the tribe of Judah. How is this possible? Only by the mercy and grace of of the Lord who can turn a life of horrible depravity into one of responsibility and submission to the Lord. Joseph concludes our portion here this morning by saying, Far be it from me that I should do so, that is, conscript all the brothers into servanthood as a result of this apparent crime. Joseph says, Only the man in whose hand the cup was found shall be my servant. But as for you, go in peace to your father. And uh, Joseph uh, pauses there, and the rest of the chapter is the intercession of Judah for Benjamin, which, as I mentioned, we'll cover at a later date. But, how, but then we see this. Let me just close with this note. Joseph suggests, go in peace to your father. There's also an assurance of peace in the last chapter where the steward had told the brothers, hey, don't worry about that money in your sacks. Peace to you. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has put treasure in your sacks for you. I received your money. Then he brought Simeon to them. The steward has said, peace to you. Joseph has said, go in peace. Does that help the brothers? In their clothes tearing anguish? It does not. Why? Well, Judah has expressed this rightly in verse 16. What should we say to my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how can we clear ourselves? God has found out the guilt of your servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servants. And once again, as I said before, they technically are not guilty of stealing the cup nor the money. Nevertheless, Judah testifies to their guilt. And what is he speaking of? Well, I believe he's speaking of a guilt that ran much deeper still. And he is acknowledging that they are without excuse and cannot answer for their actions because they deserve this and much more. The brothers realize that they deserve uh, to be all conscripted into slavery, if not killed, because of their past sins. We are without excuse. We have fallen short of the glory of God in New Testament terms. We refuse to defend ourselves, but instead acknowledge that we have been caught red-handed, not by you and your divining cup, but by the Sovereign, the Lord Almighty. Truly, all this has come to come upon us because of our prior sin. How can we be justified is really the heart of Judah's cry and question. God has found out the guilt of your servants. How can we clear ourselves? Let's close this message by answering that question. And in answering it, let's turn once again to a text we visited before from Romans 4 and 5. The end of Romans 4 and the, end of, and the beginning of Romans 5 address this question. How can we clear ourselves? Or, more precisely, how can we be justified? We who are guilty of committing cosmic treason, great sin, great iniquity against the thrice holy, awesome, sovereign ruler of the universe. He sees all, he knows all, and we and our wickedness and evil have transgressed him, and we have done so with brazen cruelty, so to speak. How can we be saved? Well, the scriptures answer. Verse 23 of Romans 4, But the words that was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for yours also. 
it will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord. He, or who was, delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Justification means a legal ruling of innocence. So Jesus, because he was killed and raised again, this is how we will be justified. This is how we will answer for our sins. 5.1, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, faith in what? The death, burial, resurrection, the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him we also have obtained access by faith into His grace which we, in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Paul goes on to say it really relates to our passage, Genesis 44. More than, more than that, we rejoice even in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. Here is the answer to the brother's cry. How can we be saved? How can we be justified? We are guilty. We have been found out. How can we, in peace, return to our Father? How can we go in peace, assured at this, through the mouth of, the, of Joseph Stewart? Well, the, the answer is only through the trust and faith that the Lord, through his ascended Messiah, Jesus Christ one day, of whom Joseph was a picture, would extend the hand of forgiveness based upon his own suffering. We've talked about this a lot, but what was the cost of reconciliation of the covenant family? It was the suffering of the appointed son. Because Joseph was thrown into a pit and was lifted up and was placed in a position of exalted authority, therefore the family could be saved. Because Jesus was killed on the cross of Calvary and thrown into the grave and rose again after three days, paying the penalty for our sin. Therefore, we are restored as the covenant family of God and we are justified. Joseph's role in this picture of the Old Testament prefigured that of Jesus. And these questions that are brought to the surface as the Lord changes the heart of the brothers are answered in Christ alone. What a glorious perspective we have as saints who have been given all of the Bible. We can look at these pictures of the Old Testament and see their fulfillment in Christ and praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for His revelation through the pages of Scripture and the assurance of our own peace with God regardless of our prior sins because of what He, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the Joseph to come, has accomplished through His suffering unto glory. So let's close in thankfulness for this today. Father, we thank you for the powerful revelation in your Holy Scripture in so many ways revealed to us, even through the testimony of Joseph and his brothers so long ago. I pray that you would write upon the tables of our hearts afresh, Lord, the joy of our salvation for those that truly know you in this place, that we can stand before you, Lord, justified because Christ has paid the penalty for our sin. Lord, let the knowledge of this reality conform us more to the image of Christ. May we walk according to his precepts as an overflow of worship for what he has done. For those in the hearing of this message who may not have turned from their sin, repented and believed, I pray, Lord, that you would work conviction upon their souls and understanding that nothing escapes your attention. Before we, we all will stand guilty before you one day unless we're clothed with the righteous robes of another that another is Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, whom we proclaim this day. We pray that you would move the unbeliever to repent of his sin and to have faith in Jesus Christ, the one who came and died, that we might be saved. In his name we pray. Amen.